Our readings today, well, our first reading today comes from Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you, there is forgiveness so that we can, with reverence, serve you. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He will himself redeem Israel from all their sins. And our second reading, Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 15. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. May God bless the healing, hearing and the living of this word. And further from the writings of Emanuel Swedenborg, Divine Providence, number 280. Another popular misconception is that when sins have been forgiven, they are also set aside. This misconception is characteristic of people who believe that their sins are forgiven through the sacrament of the Holy Supper, even though they have not set them aside by repenting from them. It is also characteristic of people who believe they are saved by faith alone or by papal dispensations. They all believe in direct mercy and instant salvation. When the sequence is reversed though, it is true. When sins have been set aside, they are forgiven. Repentance must precede forgiveness and apart from repentance, there is no forgiveness. That is why the Lord told his disciples to preach repentance for the forgiveness of sins and why John preached the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The Lord forgives everyone's sins. He does not accuse us or keep score. However, he cannot take our sins away except by the laws of divine providence. For when Peter asked how many times he should forgive someone who had sinned against him, whether seven was enough. He said that Peter should forgive not seven times, but 70 times seven times. What does this tell us about the Lord, who is mercy itself? So my friends, forgiveness is one of those topics which seems fairly simple on the outside, that actually contains multitudes within it. And I believe this is partly because forgiveness is such an emotional topic. To countenance forgiveness, we have to come face to face with the fact that human beings mess up so much and hurt each other all the time. Thinking deeply about forgiveness means that we have to acknowledge that these hurts have ongoing consequences that they are sometimes held deep within us for a long time. We have to embrace accountability and admit how difficult that is for the human ego and how many times we will avoid it. And we have to acknowledge the fragility of human relationship, how dependent it is upon our ability to forgive each other. So it makes sense that forgiveness would be a part of the Lord's prayer it is an important spiritual and transformational practice. And clearly in the biblical context, 
it was specifically important to Jesus as well. For in our Matthew text, he expounds upon the notion of forgiveness even after he finished telling them how to pray as part of his famous Sermon on the Mount. And so the first important thing to acknowledge about forgiveness as a notion is that forgiveness is a function of relationship. It always occurs within relationship and it doesn't really have any meaning except as a function of relationship. Now this certainly can include our relationship with ourselves or even our higher and lower selves, but ultimately forgiveness only comes into play because there is a disconnection between two things in relationship. It is a holy threshold, an essential recognition of our infallibility, but also a declaration of hope that relationship can exist and thrive in the face of imperfection. Imagine if forgiveness didn't exist, how alone and isolated how rigid yet fractured we would be. But even though forgiveness represents a moving forward of relationship through the process of dealing with disagreement and tension, that doesn't always mean that moving forward is the same thing as the continuance of the relationship as it was. The outcome of forgiveness is many times the repairing of relationship but it sometimes also is the letting go of relationship. And so let's consider these in turn. As human beings, as the Lord's prayer shows us, we incur debts to one another, debts of empathy, understanding, care, concern, and dignity. And there are so many ways that we hurt and disappoint one another. And we often feel the pain of this deeply. And many times this debt or disconnect is created because of an imbalance between how we expected to be treated and how we were actually treated. And this disconnect threatens or prevents relationship. Enter forgiveness. Disconnection of relationship is not necessarily a terminal condition, thank the Lord. Forgiveness is the process by which relationship is restored. But because it is a function of relationship, it requires engagement on the part of all who are in the relationship. Forgiveness requires accountability, or what Swedenborg calls repentance, on the part of one who was hurtful, and grace on the part of the one who was hurt. Both sacrifice ego, one sacrifices rightness, and the other invulnerability. Relationship depends upon empathy, upon caring about the well-being of another. And part of that caring must include accountability when it is warranted. Without accountability, without repentance, forgiveness as a function of relationship repair is not possible because refusing accountability is a fundamental abdication of empathy of putting oneself in another's shoes and imagining their point of view. And how can relationships survive without empathy? This is part of what is making our national talk of unity so fraught right now. We yearn for true relationship with our fellow citizens, but worry that papering over differences without an effort towards reparation just perpetuates existing cycles of injustice. And I recall this challenge as a parent, that we teach our children to say, I'm sorry from a very young age. But at some point, we also need to teach them how to be sorry. We need to teach them the value of empathy and accountability. We need to teach them that empty, empty words cannot carry relationship and that to be sorry means to act differently in the future. And we see from our reading today that Swedenborg was very critical of religious traditions that tried to circumvent true repentance, that offered what he called instantaneous salvation, a wiping away of our transgressions, no matter how we regard them. Other theologians like Dietrich Bonhoeffer have called that cheap grace. 
The work of repentance must cost us something, must cause a re-evaluation of our ego and identity so that an actual new and different future for the relationship in question can be brought into being. But just because something is costly, doesn't make it a punishment. We often think about relationship in terms of give and take, but I'm not sure that works very well here as it invites a sense that repentance is something that we take or exact from each other. Forgiveness is really more about give and give. One gives repentance, the other gives grace and a new future gets to be written in relationship. And this is what Jesus was referring to in the Matthew text from today. A lot of the time, Jesus speaks of forgiveness in terms of pride and hypocrisy. He cautions his disciples against holding grudges or about withholding forgiveness in exchange for power. And it is in this context we hear the end of our Matthew text, which on the face of it sounds rather transactional but really is about cultivating a compassionate state of mind. The refusal of either accountability or grace for selfish reasons just compounds sin upon sin and will close our hearts way down every time. God always forgives and always will, but that can't have any functional reality for us until we open our minds to what we need to be forgiven for and then extend that humble mindset to our interactions with others. So what about the other side of things? Forgiveness as relinquishment. What about when no accountability or repentance is on offer? Forgiveness still has a role to play here, but it is less about repair and more about freedom. When an emotional debt has caused a disconnect in relationship and the one who has hurt us refuses accountability, it is very difficult to continue forward. And even if the relationship is severed, that does not mean we might not still be tethered to it in an emotional way. There is no world in which it is God's intention for us to remain in that hurt forever. Forgiveness can release us, but it can also be very hard. The way in which we culturally unconsciously understand forgiveness can make us feel like forgiving a hurt means somehow we are condoning it. Think about the common words, it's okay, I forgive you. These words are usually offered in the context of relationship repair but take on a whole different tone when repentance is not even offered. The words, it's okay, will oftentimes hover over any contemplation of forgiveness, whether we realize it or not. So it's important to remember that forgiveness is not a statement of right or wrong. Forgiveness is an action that intentionally heals a wound. Whatever hurts we have endured, our pain is a declaration of the wrongness of what has happened to us. And that declaration will always stand. But still, the potential of that holy threshold remains unresolved. And forgiveness practiced on our own part can release us from that lack of resolution. This kind of forgiveness will necessarily contains some measure of grief and a recognition that it is God's work to reform other people, not ours. Like I said, hard spiritual work that takes the time it takes. But of course, a God of love would wish this kind of release for us and help us to make it so. Now, I know I've simplified things a little here, perhaps even a lot. It certainly is possible to feel hurt based on our sense of ego or entitlement or false assumptions. There is such a thing as selfish pain and not all hurt means that someone else did something wrong. 
And it is also true that it is possible to hurt someone unintentionally. And the associated repentance in that case will feel different to when hurt is actually intended. And I've said nothing at all on the topic of consequences, which are often an important part of accountability or healthy boundaries, which are an important part of healing. Forgiveness tugs on a multitude of strings because the restoration of relationship is complicated and contextual and individual. But the ultimate goal is wholeness, however it can be found. The Psalm from our reading today said, but with you there is forgiveness so that we can with reverence serve you. Our God models an unrelenting forgiveness, not because of some hazy idealism, but because it is the only way to stay in relationship with us, God's fallible creation. And God wants that more than anything else. Amen.